Fred, let's continue to take a look at the life of Desmond Dutu. We're joined now by former Commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Desmond Dutu Peace Center trustee, Auntie Yasmin Suka. Auntie Suka, thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, just to get what it is that you are feeling at this moment, how are you holding up? Well, it's, you know, it, it's been incredibly sad um, since the news of his passing. But tonight when I attended the memorial service, which was arranged by the IP Trust and the Legacy Foundation, I was really inspired by three speakers. Um, you know, the Reverend Alan Busak, then in Kosi Mandela Mandela, and Mrs. Grassa Michelle all spoke um, this evening. And what they spoke about is that while we mourn the Archbishop, it's really important also to make sure um, that we all individually pledge to do something that will honor the fact that he stood for truth and justice. And that, you know, his life would be wasted if we didn't continue to take up the struggles that he engaged in, particularly in speaking truth to power. And Mrs. Michelle was particularly poignant because she said that when you look at the giants that, in a sense, were responsible for the transition in South Africa, most of them are now gone. And the arch was the last of them. And so the only way in which we can honor them is to ensure that there are thousands of other young people who take up the struggle um, and, and that we commit ourselves to ensuring that South Africa becomes a more just place, the world really in which the arch actually believe. And so in, in many ways, um, you know, the night was extraordinary because as we mourn, we are also able to celebrate and to think about what kind of future can we build going forward for the next generation? So that really strengthened me today. It was that deliverance by Magrasa Michelle where she also pointed out that there's no one to mourn anymore. She doesn't have anybody to mourn. Ms. Patricia DeLille earlier on saying that enough talking, it's time for action. What does that look like in a country like South Africa? Well, I, you know, the one reverberating theme across the world is really what I would call the unfinished transition in South Africa. And that is not only about, you know, the work around building a nation, but it's also about creating a more just society in South Africa to ensure that you don't have people who go hungry at night. And Mrs. Michelle spoke really eloquently to that. But it's also about the unfinished business of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which took up so much of the Archer's life. And that is why I think that we all have to dedicate ourselves to ensuring that, number one, each one of us pledges to do something about the poverty and inequality in our country, which is racialized. But we also need to ensure that our leaders take up this issue of the unfinished business and that is ensuring that the TRC cases which remain outstanding are investigated and where possible prosecutions take place. And then, of course, the question of reparations, which I think really pains our the victims and their families greatly. It's time to have an honest discussion about what can we do to ensure that we realize their hopes and aspirations. And then, of course, the question of how do we build a country and build the kind of bridges that the arch believed in to find that spark of humanity in all of us, which he saw and which he believed would be necessary for building a South Africa? That's what we have to reclaim um, from mourning him, I think, so that we can really make a difference unfinished transition in South Africa, unfinished business of the TRC. We need to have an honest discussion as a country. You were intimately involved with the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and so was he. Do you remember, uh, I guess perhaps just for the sake of a generation also, that only just hears these terms, right, the TRC, but 
we don't really know the stories or, you know, some of the stories. One that particularly stands out for you and one that you remember bothered him. Well, you know, I've been dealing in the last 23 years with a number of cases, but the ones that really stand out for me are the ones which I have been really pushing forward. And the one that really is a resounding and reverberating um, stain really on our conscience is that of the story of a young woman who is a student in Swaziland who was entrapped and brought back to South Africa more than 35 years ago, Nakatula Similani. Mm. And she was captured by the security branch. She was brutally tortured for weeks on end. She was handcuffed both with her hands and permission. They heard the amnesty applications of a number of security branch members who claimed that yes, they had abducted her, but they then said that she had escaped to rejoin the ANC. And of course, in the amnesty process, there were divisions amongst the security operatives. The black Askari said that there was absolutely no way that Nakatula would have been able to escape because she was so brutalized and her arms and her hands were manacled. She was so bloody that it was unlikely that she would have been able to escape. And the, on the other hand, the white security branch members said, well, she had escaped to rejoin the ANC. And of course, many people, including her commander who died recently, the late Duma in Corsi, said she never returned to the ANC and that she was probably murdered by the security branch. Now, the family of Nakatula Similani had to go to court in 2006, firstly, to compel prosecution guidelines. And then in 2016, they went to court again to ensure that the state would make a decision on prosecuting her murderers. And in fact, this case was set down for trial earlier this year, and it has now been postponed to May next year. And the family are saying that one of the things we need to do is to ensure that Nakatula Samalani's perpetrators are indicted under international criminal law, and that in fact they are charged with an enforced disappearance, bearing in mind that this is an international crime. And of course, to date, the NPA has refused to do that, and in fact are charging her alleged murderers with ordinary murder under the common law and that is just not good enough and so the family have in fact instructed that we take this matter up but what resonates of course is the fact that in the passing years Nakatula's father and her brother passed on and this year alone we have had three of the perpetrators in this case also passing on and so with each day what you have is a risk for the family in terms of both truth recovery and justice. And this is just one particular case. Mm -hmm. We have so many other cases in the wings. And, you know, that is why it was so important that the chairperson of the Justice Portfolio Committee summons both the Minister of Justice and the head of the NPA to explain why they were not able to come back to the family of Lucanio Colata and the widows of the Craddock Four to give them a decision. They treated them so callously. And in fact, at the end of that hearing in, a, in the media briefing, the head of the NPA said, well, she doesn't see many of these cases reaching prosecution. And I wanted to ask her the question, what was the basis for your saying that? Have you taken into account the feelings of families are you ever going to tell them what you have really done to ensure that their cases will actually come to fruition? And I believe that, you know, the death of the Archbishop... I'm is Sisuka, I hate that I have to do this, but I, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for walking us down memory lane um, and to a large degree still a reality. Uh, Yasmin Suka, former TRC commissioner. Thank you, ma'am.